Hello and welcome to another episode of At My Desk. I'm, of course, your host, Dr. William Lester. And this program is brought to you by the American Institute of Metaphysics. So, today I want to talk a little bit about one of one of my, my favorite subjects, and that is uh, UFOs. And we've touched on uh, ufology here and there over the course of this series. Um, but I wanted to uh, get into a particular discussion uh, that uh, has, well, that rears its head up every now and then. And uh, it's a reflection of a question that I get often. And it goes like this. Do you believe in UFOs? Are you a UFO believer? And that's usually a question that comes from someone who is not uh, informed uh, on the subject uh, very much other than what they may see here and again on television or on the internet. And I want to touch on this because this is very prevalent. You know, not just when it comes to UFOs, but with a lot of different subjects. But, you know, now we'll keep it to UFOs. This is not about a belief system. Because you can believe in something in the absence of any information or data or uh, any kind of empirical uh, body of information. Now, can we prove that UFOs exist? Well, now, if you mean can can someone, you know, can some well-informed, uh, uh, well-versed advocate go into a courtroom and prove it? Probably yes. Probably yes. But that's a lot different than proving it uh, to a person or persons or organizations or agencies that are simply predisposed not to accept it as a reality. Because let's remember what we're doing. And I think you would agree with me that the following is true. There are some instances in which a person, uh, regardless of the information that they are presented with, will not budge in their opinion or their outlook or their insight. They just won't budge. Hence the old saying, don't bother me with the facts my mind's made up. But anyway, I wonder if any of you or how many of you are familiar with the Project Blue Book Special Report 14. Because if you're not, I'm going to share a little bit of it with you on this episode. Now, if you have any level of familiarity with the UFO phenomenon, you've probably heard of Project Blue Book, which was the Air Force's official UFO investigatory arm. Um, mostly in the 50s, it was shut down in 1969, officially shut down in 1969. But this special report 14, okay, was a massive statistical analysis of over 3,200 cases, okay? And this, this uh, analysis, this study, this, this project went on from 1952 to 1954. So this was not a small little survey that they were conducting. This wasn't a straw poll. This was a massive uh, undertaking. So let's look at what this report was all about. So it says here, the sightings, the 3,200 sightings were broken down into six 
areas or six characteristics. Okay, color, number, the duration of the sighting, brightness, shape, and speed. So that's a pretty nice round look at any given case. Next, they took those characteristics of each sighting and compared between knowns and unknowns to see if there was a statistically significant difference or variation. Now, what when they talk about knowns or unknowns, where are they going with this? Well, there are certain things up in the air, up in the sky, that we already know about. Those are the knowns. Conventional aircraft of, of many different uh, varieties. Uh, weather conditions, atmospheric conditions. Certainly um, uh, astronomical uh, realities, the moon, stars, etc. Those are the knowns. And then of course, you know, when they say unknowns, well, I guess if it doesn't fall under any of those categories, it must be an unknown. But anyway, as you can see, this is a very deep analysis uh, being given here. All right, some of the results. Because the, these are the these are the things that are not getting talked about with respect to UFOs. I mean, you know, people talk about I believe, I don't believe, I saw this, I, but this gets down to some of the information that was revealed in this study. Okay, sixty nine percent, sixty nine percent of those cases of those thirty two hundred, okay, were considered identifiable. Okay. Now, let's just stay on this 69%. Out of that 69%, 38% was considered conclusively identified. In other words, there's no doubt whatsoever about what this is. Out of that 69%, 31% were explained somewhat. We think we know what that was. We're pretty confident. We can't, we can't classify it as conclusively identifiable, but we're pretty sure we know what that is. Now the other remaining 9%, the remaining 9% fell into insufficient information. So let's back up again. We have 69% of the 3,200 judged as identified. 38% of that conclusive. 31% may be identifiable. 9% insufficient information. I wonder how much of that 31% that's questionable can be can be shaved off into that. You know what I'm saying? Uh, because that's that's a that's a gray area that maybe could use another look. So when you hear cynics and debunkers make the claim that 99% of all UFO cases are explainable or have a conventional explanation. Well, based on this massive statistical analysis, that's not true. So cynics and debunkers are quite capable of engaging in propaganda if it furthers their furthers their agenda. Now, let's get back to this analysis. We just covered 
Here's where it gets fun. 22%. 22% were regarded as unknown. Now, originally, they had it at 28%. But obviously, that was looked at as just much too stark a percentage, much too high a percentage of unknown. You know, the, the more you classify as unknown, the more you've got on the table that you've got to account for. So, they, you know, that's got to be shaved down, 22%. But in, a, in an analysis of this magnitude, 22% is a significant figure that's got to be looked at and considered. Now, we've got this 22% known. And again, we're dealing with 3,200 cases. 86% of the knowns were aircraft, balloons, or had astronomical explanations. Okay. Now that's 86% of the knowns. So we won't, we'll, we'll get to the unknowns in a minute. 1.5% of all cases were judged to be psychological. They saw it, they thought they saw it, but they didn't, or it was just their imagination or delusion or one of my favorites, mass hysteria. There's an 8% of what they call miscellaneous. which is an interesting way of saying it, but apparently that included possible hoaxes. So again, 86% of the knowns, aircraft, balloons, or astronomical explanations. Now I wonder if that's a nice way of saying Venus and swamp gas. Here's an interesting statement within this study. And this is one that will probably make debunkers a little uncomfortable. The higher the quality of the case, the more likely it was to be classified unknown. Now listen to what's being said here. The higher the quality of the case, the more likely it was to be classified unknown. You can't impugn the witness, you can't impugn the setting or the situation or the conditions. It's a quality case. Another little piece of information that the cynics and the debunkers will will uh, leave out. 35% of the excellent cases were deemed unknown. So I guess if they're talking about quality cases, one category of quality case is, is excellent. And so 35% of the excellent cases were deemed unknowns as opposed to only 18% of the poorest cases. Hmm. Now, if you're interested in UFOs, this is the episode that you need to make sure that you save so that you can uh, have a discussion in case you uh, have to deal with a debunker or a cynic. Uh, you can use this as a, as a, as a point of reference. Okay, in all six studied citing characteristics, remember those citing characteristics, the unknowns were different from the knowns at a highly statistical significant level. 
and five of the six measures. Now remember, let's go back. Those six characteristics, color, number, duration, brightness, shape, and speed. Okay? And five of the six measures, the odds of knowns differing from unknowns by chance was only 1% or less. When all six characteristics were considered together, the probability of a match between knowns and unknowns was less than one in a billion. Less than one in a billion. So, now, there, there are other uh, little nooks and crannies to this report that we could go into ad nauseum. But these are some of the some of the highlights some of the highlights of uh, of the report. And I can't get away from that 22% unknown. Now, what's interesting is that regardless of how this looks, regardless of, of how the numbers fall down, somehow by 1955, the Air Force made the claim that this analysis demonstrated that UFOs did not exist. Isn't that interesting? We studied something 22% of which we simply can't explain. But that points to the fact that it doesn't exist. Now, how does that work? How do you get away with, with saying that? How do you get away with, on the one hand, saying 22% of these are unknown, and on the other hand, you're saying, and none of it's real? You do it, and... I'm just going to harken back to something that I've stated on an earlier show. You don't do it with a cover-up. You don't do it with a cover-up. I know that there are people who feel that the subject of UFOs are, 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 or the truth of UFOs are covered up or the fact that UFOs are real are covered up. No, it's not. No, it isn't. The truth about UFOs or the UFO reality is being managed, or rather the information is being managed. As I've said before, information management is a lot less labor intensive than a cover up. Cover up requires so many logistics, so much redundancy, so many resources, so much manpower. It's a lot easier to manage, effectively manage the information. How do you do that? Well, one of the things that you do, particularly in light of the Freedom of Information Act, is you develop a system and strategy of dodges and weaves to get around having to 
release information when it's requested or releasing pertinent information. Once every year or so, either our government or the British government or the French government or this government or Australia, some government does a, does a data dump of UFO files. And all of the news agencies, they go, oh, God, they're releasing uh, uh, UFO files. Well, they're releasing those files because there's really nothing in them that we don't already know. So there's no smoking gun there for the cover-up people. Uh, to high-five each other over. But let's get back to the information management because this, this, this kind of data dump, this file release that you see going on once or twice a year by uh, various countries is part of that information management. Because what they're really doing is giving themselves a little bit of cover, right? Because whenever it hits the fan, they can very quickly stand up and say, well, we released everything. We released this information. How could we possibly have been covering up when we released this information? And they're right. To that extent. Information management. The other way you do it is by making sure that the nuts and bolts of this issue is not taken seriously by heavyweights in the press. Your local news channel, you know, in Poughkeepsie or Peoria, We'll do a UFO piece every now and then. But what about BBC? Or CNN? Or the New York Times? Or the Washington Post? They're not going to be bothered with that. Why? Not because any one of those agencies knows anything about this issue but because they've been conditioned through a system and program of information management that this is a ridiculous topic. It's a non-issue. It certainly is not worthy of the time and resources of an august news organization. Tongue-in-cheek rolling eyes. That way they'll never get into this thing because, and I've said this before, and I will continue to maintain that it is true. To properly manage UFO information by marginalizing, marginalizing it in the media is critical because if those agencies like the BBC, like CNN, if these agencies took this subject seriously, because let's be honest, this is the biggest, this is the biggest story in the history of mankind. This is, as Stanton Friedman has often said, it's like a cosmic water gate. If this subject were taken seriously by those agencies and they decided to jump in and pour their resources into it and pour their manpower into it and started pursuing all of these leads, all of these stories, all of these sightings, cases, reports, this, that, and they started pursuing that, 
with a rigorous, aggressive, uh, uh, reckless abandon, they could get to the bottom of it. They can get to the bottom of it. And that's why it's crucial for those individuals, groups, agencies who have taken some jurisdiction over this issue. That's why it's critical for them to maintain this, this systematic information management. So, Project Blue Book Special Report Number 14. Look it up. I've just kind of thumbnailed it for you today. But I hope it at least inspires you to uh, look a little further, a little deeper. And get a little better informed on this subject of, of, of UFOs and the reality of them. And you don't have to get pulled into any more debates or discussions about whether or not UFOs are real. Because the Air Force proved that they were, even though they claimed that that same report proved that they don't. But that is not the first nor the last uh, inconsistent statement of misrepresentation that, that we will deal with coming from officialdom. So, I want to thank you for joining me. And I hope that you will continue to follow this program. I am Dr. William Lester, and I look forward to seeing you next time right here at my desk. Thank <laughs> you.